Welcome everyone, Kostin here with a discussion about Elspeth von Draken for Total War Warhammer 3, Thrones of Decay. Now I can't show you gameplay footage just yet, tomorrow I'll be able to. But for now, let's take a look at the blog post that Creative Assembly has put together on the subject of Elspeth and the Imperial rework. There's quite a few very, very interesting details over here. So, Elspeth. She's a respected advisor to Electra Count Emmanuel, uh, Countess Emmanuel of Nuln. She's a potent Lore of Death spellcaster with a hefty scythe to boot and a healthy mix of subversion and magic. She can have a warhorse or the Carmine Dragon. Hmm, no Pegasus for her. I wonder how that's going to be. I imagine that the Carmine Dragon is going to be available later on. Imperial Gunner School, unique campaign mechanic, focused on developing the next stages of Imperial weaponry with black powder and wizardry and then the gardens of more a new building type allowing elspeth to transport her armies instantly to the gardens of more constructed within friendly imperial cities okay and then there's uh some detail yeah having an imperial lord on a carmine dragon is certainly gonna clip vlad's wings so to speak uh, she can reverse the sands in her favor, healing her wounds by siphoning life from an enemy via direct damage. Ooh, <laughs> so she's got regeneration, some form of uh, regeneration. And then there's Darkpocker, an act of augment that grants Elspeth a large helping of physical resistance and triggers the strength their attribute. Okay, and then you have the Imperial Gunnery Skull. As I pretty much expected, this really looks like Ikiklaw's laboratory just taken for for the Empire. So they showcase the mortar over here, so you get explosive blast radius, gonna make them more uh, useful. Snipe for mortar units, stock for more uh, mortar units um, over there available. And then a couple of other upgrades. Now, looking at this list, I imagine, so the mortar obviously affects all mortar units, including the war wagon and of course the electro count unit. I wonder if the handgunner portion over here is going to affect all the units. It should, right? Like all the regular handgunners, the null iron sides, all that. Um, but we have to wait and see. And then you get the mounted uh, cavalry. So you get outriders, grenade launchers. I wonder if that's going to affect the grenade launcher outrider version. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. Then you get help Alastor volley guns, hellstorms, uh, the siege tank, and the land ship. So, the Empire's arsenal needs an upgrade fast and a long-standing institution of great knowledge. Okay. She offers permanent upgrades for gunnery and artillery units in return for schematics. The resource earned from using gunnery units in battle, as well as from special post-battle options when defeating enemy gunpowder units. Huh. Very, very interesting over there. I mean, you're probably not necessarily going to fight a lot of enemy gunpowder units, because who would you fight? Like, the dwarves, I guess? Or the Vampire Coast, though our Ness is going to have a really bad day. Anyway, some Imperial Gunnery School upgrades are available from the start. Uh, and of course, there's like a claw, I imagine, I think. We'll see if the Skaven count as gunpowder. <laughs> Not quite sure they do. Well, Giselle's should, right, at the very least. Um, some Imperial Gunnery School upgrades are available from the start, but innovation is nothing okay, and thus more advanced upgrades require the Gunnery School itself to advance. The Imperial Gunnery School can be advanced via field testing, a series of challenges and prerequisites that prove the institution has what it takes. So, very much a Kiklaus lab. And then there's the Amethyst Armory. Here's where further schematics can be spent on exclusive Amethyst units and powerful restockable single-use abilities. So you're not just going to get one nuke, we're going to get multiple uh, nuclear weapons. And then you get the Gardens of Morn, which basically will allow teleportation to various areas. This is going to be useful when you're trying to hold the Empire together because it's a pretty large bit of territory where you get attacked on multiple sides, so this is certainly going to be very, very useful uh, for her. So, with the Gardens of more, Elspeth uh, von Draken erects new Black Tower buildings in any visible, friendly, or neutral Empire settlements and reaps powerful benefits. When constructed, Elspeth... Uh, army can travel instantly to any selected Gardens of Morn via fast travel, which both has a cost and a cooldown. So right there you can see the cooldown is five turns. I'm not sure if that's representing total cooldown or if it's in progress. We'll see. Um, also offer construction of powerful buildings that can push back corruption, allow for recruitment in foreign territory, and much more. Basically, this is Oxyatl's mechanic. 
taken and given uh, to Elspeth. Now, mind you, there's two components to Axiotl's mechanics. The one is, of course, the Sanctums. The second one is all the missions he gets that take him around the world. Els Elspeth doesn't have those missions, by what I'm reading here. Um, I haven't played her. But um, she does have this basically Sanctum or the Empire version of Sanctums and then Sanctums. Then you look at Fyodor Bruckner, so yeah, he's gonna be a really powerful melee combatant. I mean, there's not much more to say on that, like, there's a lot of detail, a lot of text here, but yeah, he's basically a really good duelist and really good fighter. Uh, you got the Master Engineer who's, like, wielding a literal hand cannon over there, holy crap. I'm curious what that in the... Like, that's a rifle in the back, but I'm guessing he's going to use that uh, hand cannon, uh, pretty much. But we'll see on that. Um, he can be mounted on a warhorse, mechanical steed, or even within a steam tank? Holy shit. Oh, okay, so that's a grenade launcher. Didn't realize that quite there. Okay. That's, uh, <laughs> give this guy a siege tank mount? Okay. <laughs> that's, uh, that's certainly gonna <laughs> make things interesting. And then you get the regular engineers, so it's like mechanical horses. All right, CA, you're really going with some crazy stuff over here. <laughs> I mean, it's like, what, uh, are the Empire have become the gnomes of uh, World of Warcraft? That, that, that's kind of how it feels. But yeah, you get engineers, so... They're engineers. There's not much more really to say. So you get a repeater rifle for them. You get um, you get the fancy new mount, and yeah, they're just basically gonna be like dwarf engineers, I imagine, in combat um, and on the campaign, like mobility and all that. Then you get null ironside. So they change the weapon. They say they they change the the weapon over here, but um, they all. They changed it from the trailer because they were showing it with repeaters, but now they changed them with master rot handguns, play armor, and highly drilled firing discipline. Okay, so that's a pretty big handgun. And then the real sniper rifle of the Warhammer universe, the Hawkland long rifle. So yeah, say hello to the Empire Gisales. Like it's basically taking Ica Claw and making him an Imperial Legendary Lord the way I'm seeing it. And then you get the Knights of the Black Rose. So these guys are going to be your melee cavalry. Think of it um, like questing knights, I imagine, based on like all that's read uh, over here. So equipped with the sword and shield, they excel at prolonged combat without the need to cycle in and out, helping them lock down the enemy as their fellow cavalry push in front flank. So regular cavalry is good for charging. They're good for dealing with enemy cavalry, but they're not so great in prolonged melee fights. These guys will be. So that's why I mean questing knights, because that's exactly what questing knights do. And then there is the steam tank with volley guns. Okay, so new siege tank. It still has a cannon, though it is of a smaller variety over there at the top. Uh, I'm guessing that's not uh, the same kind of cannon as this one, but we'll see on that. Um, in interesting thing that they mention here. So they can, it can fire while um, moving. It has a directional shield with allows it to block projectiles from all sides. I'm curious if that affects the regular siege tank. And then, uh, yeah, it's got an engineer right, an engineer commander right at the top. And then you got the Marienburg landship. Oh, yeah. So the Marienburg landship launches light cannon rounds from its culverin and crush component underfoot whilst the crew remain on deck above, armed the rifles to pick off any passers-by. So it's basically... Just going to so it's a tank basically more or less. It's a tank. It's more of a tank than a regular tank in the sense that it's got all those ga uh, gunners over there, or really it's maybe what the war wagon should have been, but that's a different discussion. Um, and then legacy update. So there's a lot of discussion about like the imperial authority on electric count system. It's like it worked quite well in Warhammer 2, but it doesn't work very well in Warhammer 3 because of new threats. Yeah, there's more legendary lords in the empire, so it kind of breaks the system basically because a lot of the minor imperial factions, they just get annihilated. Like you've got Festus, you've got Draka. Oh boy, you, do you have uh, problems uh, to uh, deal with beyond, you know, deal, dealing with uh, Vlad as well. So, uh, they've changed that in this particular situation. I mean, there's also Grom to consider. So, they've changed uh, the Imperial uh, authority system. So, it's now reworked and separate from the Electric Count system. 
while the electric count system is often not appropriate. Okay, so uh, all imperial factions now have access to imperial authority. However, the feature only becomes active once they own land within empire territory. So the electric count is now exclusive to Karl Franz. Uh, Gelt has new toys online below, so I'm guessing every, like every other Ledger and Lord is not going to have to deal with their Electrocounts mechanic, it's not going to have it. So Imperial Authority is available for everyone, Electrocounts is exclusive to Karl Franz. Imperial Authority, when, okay, they explain how um, uh, that works. And what Imperial Authority does is basically it shows how much the Empire is actually controlled by the Empire. And we'll divvy out records, uh, rewards accordingly whilst giving you a clear view of how well the Empire of man is doing you as a whole. Um, then there is some tweaks and improvements that have been made to the Electrocount's UI to tidy up, fix colorability and all that, and summon Electrocount's visible at all times. And new marketers have been added to Empire Regions to show who their rifle owner should be when owned by someone else. And some of the Electrocount's functionality has changed. Originally it replenished all Electrocount state troopers. Now when the Electrocounts are summoned, every Electrocount that is not currently garrisoned or besieged will be summoned to Carl Francis's location. <laughs> Talk about summoning the end uh, the, an endgame crisis to the Carl Franz over there. Um, and then speaking about uh, Carl Franz, so what they've changed here, they, they've given him control over Helmgard, so you will not have to deal with the miserable siege very early on, because Helmgard is really powerful as this element. It was like the third battle you would fight in a campaign as Carl Franz. Like, I, you know... Reading some of this stuff, I'm just kind of curious, like, how much of my videos CA was uh, watching. Though, of course, they probably, you know, watch a lot of other stuff and came to their own conclusions. Yeah, Helmgard stirring under Imperial Secessionist was pretty awful. Um, but now you don't have to deal with that. So you just get the bunch of minor settlement battles. It's much easier. And you can go deal with the real threat. So Festus, Vlad, Draka, etc. And you also have Elspeth to help you out with that. Because uh, she's going to be a null, right? Obvious. Pretty obvious. Um, so we have added a bunch of new tools to Carl Franz within his electoral machinations panel called Imperial Decrees. Each decree is a powerful ability that can benefit you, either your own or fellow Empire factions at the cost of prestige. So prestige, still there, used for electoral machinations. You can trigger Inquisition and Province to clear away some of that pesky vampire Nurgle corruption, send aid to an Elector, increases their fealty, and spawn a temporary army for them, or safely declare war against another Elector Count without suffering fealty losses through Kaza. Belly. And he's now immune to all trespass penalties when moving through Empire territory. And then um, there's Gelt. So they put Elspeth and Null, as, they st as I stated, they put Elspeth and Null. So they've taken uh, Gelt and put them in Grand Cafe. Yep. So Gelt and Xiao Ming being a thing um, is going to happen. You know, that scene in Immortal Empire is pretty short. I I'm curious if they shot that scene in Immortal Empire, the trailer, before they decided to make this change or after, uh, you know, um, or after they decided to make this change, when they were, because they had plans going months and months, right? Like, there's probably some storyboard or some spreadsheet about, like, what they were going to for various DLCs. You can ask the question whether or not they would have reworked the Empire um, without the significant backlash of child change, but that's a different discussion for a different video. So, as he helps deal with the nomads, so you're going to be fighting nomads, you're going to be presented with a series of dilemmas that paved the way for his time in cafe, or even his return to the Empire, having secured a lifelong f uh, friendship in the process. So, read that as like, yeah, you can stay in cafe, or you can go back to the Empire. Um, Gelt has a new campaign feature, the Colleges of Magic. So whenever Gelt fights in battle with a wizard in his army, he will acquire arcane essays with the number of arcane essays per battle correlating with the number of wizards present. So it's not based on battle casualties the way I'm reading it. It's based on like how many wizards do you have in a, in a battle. And you can gain instant access to wizards from every lore of magic, allowing him to uh, accrue spellcasters quicker and easier than anyone else on the map. And then there's various um, actions. So they give up. Uh, so they give the example of the Grey Wizard, which gives the stock stance to to him, granting him them a hundred percent ambush success chance. Okay, so stock stance with a hundred percent. Ooh, some people are gonna have a really bad day. And then you can hear your entire army in a single go. Recruit a, a Jade Wizard to do so. Okay, and that's essentially um, it for what they're doing. I mean, obviously there's a lot more things that I'll be able to showcase soon enough. But yeah, I mean, 
they changed Carl Franz. They changed Gelt in a very substantial way. They added Elspeth and Nolan. And I think my conclusion on this, just reading this blog post, is like, yeah, Festus, Draca, and Vlad are going to have a really, really bad day on this. Uh, particular uh, particular subject. One of the problems, by the way, that exists in the game currently, as it is, for the Empire, is that unless you're playing Balthazar Gelt in a current campaign, what tends to happen is that Gelt will he'll take Solund and then he'll sit on his ass doing absolutely nothing. That's one of the issues, because he won't he won't declare war on Averheim. He's not, and the way the AI is scripted in Warhammer Free is the fact that the AI doesn't like to go through uh, neutral or friendly provinces to attack an enemy beyond. So, for instance, Sterling generally falls to Vlad, right? Because, like, that's his natural expansion path. Vlad might be ravaging the Empire, and Gelt will do absolutely freaking nothing for a very, very long time. Until Averheim falls. Then he gets active. With Elspeth, who shares a direct border with Sterling, well, you can understand exactly what what I'm getting into. So, and, and Carl Franz, when you're playing, like, obviously, one under AI control, Carl Franz did control the entirety of the Reichland from the very get-go, so he had a lot more potential from that, as opposed to playing him, having to spend five turns dealing with Helmgard and all that stuff before you can get the real campaign Sorry, Melland burning, Hockland burning, Sterling burning. You know, it was not a great situation, especially because of all the penalties with Imperial Authority as they exist in the game right now. There's a lot more details to obviously go into. I'll be able to do so tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just reading that blog post, I mean, I was cautiously optimistic when they announced the Nurgle changes. Let's just say the detail here is pretty good, pretty exciting. But we'll see how it actually is in the game. Cosine signing out.